All right, I don't have it up on the screen tonight because we're not going to spend very long recapping what we did Sunday night. But if you weren't here Sunday night, I don't want you to be completely lost about what we're doing. <clears throat> so Sunday morning, we talked about the importance of Bible engagement as a spiritual discipline. That means reading our Bibles, studying our Bibles, applying our Bibles, meditating on what God's Word says, all, all of these things, the memor memorizing our Bibles, all of those things are important. And then Sunday night, we started working on some techniques that I have used over the years, both in Bible study and in sermon preparation. They kind of go hand in hand. And I, I gave you both of these handouts to kind of illustrate the process I use of trying to get as much out of the scriptures as I can when I come to them to study. Now, I don't every week have all the time in the world to answer all of these questions. But the more of these things I can work through, the, the deeper the study is. Uh, this handout right here kind of illustrate, illustrates the process of what we're trying to do. I won't, again, I won't go into that in great detail. If, if you want, if you need more information, you can come talk to me, or Sunday night service is online. You can go watch that if you'd rather do that. But here in the middle is the minefield. It's bad. We don't want to take shortcuts across the minefield. We want to go from what does the text say and not go straight to, so what do we do and what does this mean to us? We want to go to back in time and say, what did, what did the original audience understand from this text? Then, because we don't want just a moral lesson that says, try harder, be better. We want to go to the cross and say, what, what can we learn from this text about Jesus? I'm paraphrasing my questions here again. What does the text tell us about Jesus? And then, once we understand what the original audience understood as best we can, and once we know how we interpret this in light of Jesus, then we go to what does this mean to us today? And so the process that we're working through with this worksheet kind of leads us around the, the long safe way around the minefield to, to try to answer all these questions and determine what is it that God wants us to understand as we go from the text as it was written 2,000 years ago, in some cases 3,500 years ago, what is it that God wants us to take from that text that was written to a specific group of people at a specific time, and how do we engage with it here in 2024 in the United States when it was written to such a completely different culture and group of people? So, if you, especially if you weren't here and you have questions about what any of this means, I'd be glad to talk with you. Or, like I said, you can you can watch the video if uh, if that's easier. And so, in order to do this, we work through some of these questions. Now, if you're thinking we only got through 17, or we only got through the first the first section of the four, that was 17 of the 40 questions. Plus, we spent a lot of time going over how to get around the minefield. So, I think the last part of this will be a little quicker. Uh, usually, I feel like the the hardest part is that first step of digging in and saying. Okay, we're, we're looking for contrasts. We're looking for repeated words. We're looking for all these little things. I feel like that's, that's the hard step. Not that the rest of this is always easy, but if you've done that first step well, it, it makes the other steps a little easier. And so what we did Sunday night was we started through Genesis chapter 3, just as an example text, one that I thought would be interesting to try this with. And we went through Genesis 3, verses 8 through 19. And I'm going to read that to you again real quick. Um, starting in, in verse 8, it says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle. And more than every beast of the field on your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your
your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you will return. So we talked about praying, we talked about reading that, in reading our text in uh, several times in, in a couple different translations if we can, and we pulled some things out of there because of reading it in a couple of uh, translations. We talked about the importance of knowing what kind of book this is and knowing what kind of text it is. Again, if, if I'm going fast and you have questions about any of this, talk to me afterwards, call me later, email me, or, or a lot of it's on the video. And so we, we realize that you're going to look for different things in different kinds of texts. We, we talked about we need to ask ourselves, what is the text about? Because sometimes we jump right to an interpretation when we haven't even really engaged with what the text is actually talking about. Talked about identifying the human writer. In this case, it's Moses. And talked about some of the background and, uh, that Moses would have had and how that sheds some light on the passage. We talked about the figures in the text and the role they play. Who remembers what the figures were in this text? God, Adam, Eve, and the serpent. Okay, and what were their roles? Serpent deceived them. Man and woman got deceived and sinned. And God was mad about it. Right? That was, <laughs> and rightly so. Uh, that, those, were their, those were their roles. We talked about the text structure and why that's important. I know that sounds like a big seminary concept, but you can go as simple as, hey, this is a story. And so we're looking for how the story begins, what the complication is, how they solve it, and how, it, how it's resolved at the end, the basic things we're looking for in a story. So this starts out there, there in the garden. Serpent deceives them. They eat. Fall of mankind. Pretty big complication. And then it's, it's resolved, at least in this text, with God coming and handing down the punishments. Uh, we looked for lists. A lot of times you will see lists in the text, and those tell you some, some important things. Sunday morning, my sermon was essentially two lists that I gave you out of what David said about the Bible, or said about the scriptures in, in uh, Psalm chapter 19. We looked at key words and phrases, and we can find some interesting things out of that. Uh, and, and the next question, question 10, is about whether they're repeated or not. And I know, so we talked about some of, the, some of the important words and phrases would have been things like eat, uh, would have been things like cursed. We talked about, uh, oh, important phrases, desire will be for your husband, he will rule over you. What does that mean? These are key things that we're going to want to understand. And then when we talked about them being repeated, uh, Jonathan even came to me afterwards and said, this is, really, this is really fun to do in a group because somebody is going to point out something that you don't see. And when we were talking about the, the repeated words, Huey pointed out that the ground was cursed and the serpent was cursed. But God didn't use the word curse with the man and the woman. And I feel like that's significant, and that's probably something I need to research further, but I wouldn't have seen that had we not done this as a group. And, and, and we wouldn't have even had that discussion if we weren't asking the question about what words are repeated. Because I don't know how it is with you raising kids, but if I say something more than once, <laughs> it's because it's important, and that's, I think that's how God does with us. We look for significant verbs, especially the commands or the wishes uh, the commands, we, we know what commands are. God says, do this. Jesus says, do this. Paul says, do this. Uh, there are several cases in, in 1 Corinthians where a passage wouldn't have any commands, but we were dealing with what we call in grammar subjunctives. They were wishes, where Paul is saying, I, I would that this happen. Sometimes that's as close to a command as we're getting. If the Bible says, if the Bible doesn't come out and say, do this, but the Bible says it's a good idea, we probably should go ahead and do this. So 
we look for some of those words, um, some of the commands that were, or, or, well, I don't, I don't remember what we found there. Uh, we identify any promises, and I think we decided most of the promises in this text were negative, right? <laughs> they were not happy promises. Um, we look for comparisons. And I'm trying to remember what we discussed Sunday. But just to give you an example of a comparison, saying something is like something else, is like when Jesus compared himself to a mother hen talking to the city of Jerusalem. Um, he did that in order for us to understand his tender love toward the people of Jerusalem, but also his, his fierceness in defending the people of Jerusalem. So Jesus was not saying, I am a chicken, but by comparing himself to a chicken, he's, he's teaching us something about himself. And when we look for comparisons in Scripture, we can, we can learn what it is God's trying to tell us. And we look for contrasts. In this passage, we saw that the... And I'm going to let you all talk once we get through the, the recap here, if I'm going real fast and not letting you talk. In, in the contrast, we saw that God said the serpent was going to be lower than all the other animals. What does that tell us? Pretty low. Pretty low, yeah. He's telling us God is big mad at the serpent. <laughs> you know, there, there's a pretty s severe punishment there. Uh, we look for cause and effect relationships. We look for the things that God ties together and says, if you do this, this will happen. What's, what's the big glaring one in this story? Eating the fruit. Eating the fruit. We're being disobedient. And what was the effect? Cause separation. Cause separation. Yeah, I think there were several answers, and they, I think they were all right. There was condemnation, there was separation, there was judgment. All of those came from disobedience. We kind of decided the main, uh, the main idea that the author, that Moses was putting forward here, was that sin has consequences. Every sin has consequences. The first time, yeah, there's consequences. I know we look at it and say, well, they just ate some fruit. What's the big deal? Even if the sin looks little to us, it has consequences. And then we talked about some questions. Your, your list may be different from other people's, but did the text raise any questions for you? Those are the things that we're, we need to jot down and research later on. It's, it's okay if you don't understand everything in a text right when you go to it. You write those things down, and so you remember them, and you go back to study them. So then we want to go to them and then. What did the audience, or how did the original audience understand the text? So this is where we're starting fresh in question 18. Who was the original audience of the book of Genesis? The people of Israel. The people of Israel, yes. Uh, during what time? Do you remember? The Exodus. Okay, around the time of the Exodus. Yeah, Moses, Moses was writing. God, God was telling him what to, what to write. Uh, what do we know about, you know, just off the top of our heads? And, and I will tell you, some of these questions about cultural background, when I've taught on this before, people have asked me, well, how do I find those answers? Because, you know, we're not just born knowing that Moses wrote this. We're not just born knowing when it was written. Uh, there are Bible dictionaries, some of them better than others. There, there are some resources uh, that, that I can give you. Your, your Bible itself may even have an introductory page to each book. That's a good place to start. Uh, but do we know anything about the, the background there with Israel that might give us some insight into how they would understand this. <coughs> what was going on with Israel during the during Moses' later ministry when he's writing these things down? They wandered around the desert because they were disobedient. Okay. They were they were themselves facing the consequences of their disobedience. They had disobeyed God and so they were wandering in the wilderness for forty years. Okay? Very good. They were they were doing a lot of murmuring and complaining. Okay. Um, anything else? A lot of blaming. A lot. They, they were blaming Moses and, and Aaron for being where they were. You know, you took us out of we want to go, you know. Excellent, excellent observation. Yeah, they were doing a lot of blaming. I hadn't thought about that. And that's what Eve was doing. What was yeah. The yeah. It was always Moses' fault. And, and my favorite one-liner about this this Genesis story, you, you've probably heard me say it, but uh, 
Adam blamed Eve. Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. My pastor used to say that when I was born. It's my favorite, but I have trouble getting it out. Um, so we know that the people of Israel, when Moses is writing this to them, they are still doing some of the exact same things that are being written about. Saying that what you're doing now goes all the way back to, to Adam and Eve. So that, how do you think the people of Israel likely, if, the, if they were self-aware enough, how do you think that they, what do you think they would have felt or thought when they read this? We're just speculating here, but based on what we know. How... Some probably thought that they might better mend their ways. Okay. Some, oh, that doesn't apply to me. That was long ago. <laughs> that like we do today. Yes, that sounds pretty familiar. Some would have thought, oh, that's old stuff. That We don't need to worry about that anymore. Others probably felt convicted and, and needed to mend their ways. Some might have felt convicted and run further from God. Um some might have just viewed it as a as a story that they really didn't think about too much. Yes, sir. Or not to go too far and see the what if or mm -hmm. kind of thing. But I, I'm assuming that the, the people of Israel had kind of talked about, you know, they, they vocally told their children, hey, yes. this, 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 and this, and so forth. But then they'd also then been influenced by the Egyptians and what they believed as far as creation and stuff. Yes. And so I think God really wanted to make sure they understood, you know. And so a lot of them might be thinking, well, that's not that's not the way I heard it. Or, you know, that's, that's a good point. Like yeah, there was probably there there probably was a lot of confusion at that time. On on the one hand, these stories were not new. I know that God directed Moses what to write exactly how that worked. I don't I don't fully understand but I believe God inspired Moses what to write down at the same time we know that this was an oral culture they passed these stories down so there there may have been some correcting of the record here also they had spent 400 years in captivity in Egypt and they would picked up Egyptian beliefs along the way so there's probably a lot of confronting here with uh, just reading this story seeing that the roots of of what they were doing then went way back to the beginning. And it's probably a warning to them that, hey, there's there's always a consequence. Even, you, you might think you can hide even. They thought they could hide in the garden, but the consequences are always gonna, are always gonna be there. Anything else on that one? <coughs> so do the scriptures available to them at that time say anything that would have shaped their understanding or do subsequent scriptures shed any light on their reaction? The reason I ask this this way, we, we want to let scripture interpret scripture. But at the same time, it's, you know, we, we get some understanding of Genesis from Hebrews, for example. But it's not fair to look at Hebrews and say, oh, they understood Genesis that way because Hebrews understands Genesis that way. Uh, they didn't have Hebrews yet. And, and what Hebrews says is true. But that doesn't mean that, that what Hebrews says was on the mind of the people in Genesis. So we want to look at what scriptures people had, that the audience had on hand at the time. If he's writing Genesis, not much. They, they probably had access to Job and the stories that were in, um, that were in, in the other um, books of the law. So there's not a lot there that tells us anything. But what are the, is there anything in later scriptures that tell us anything about how Israel viewed this story. <coughs> I can think of some indirect things in the Gospels. Yes, sir. It seems like Israel always said that they would, they would go for a while to get further and further away, and then, oh, yeah, we messed up back then. Yes. Then, <laughs> okay, we're, we're going to get back on it, and then Oh. Yes. Yeah, this is the beginning of the cycle that goes all throughout the Old Testament, especially in the, in the book of Judges. We can tell from some incidents in the Gospels where Jesus had disputes with the Pharisees that evidently Israel took 
these stories pretty seriously because those first three chapters of Genesis were a battleground in some of the in some of the debates between Jesus and the Pharisees and Jesus and the Sadducees about things like marriage. Jesus always would take them back to these early chapters and say, what does it say? And that pretty much settled the disputes. Because when he got them back to the scriptures that they both agreed on and could show them the truth from the scriptures, even if they didn't like what he had to say, they couldn't really argue it. And so that, that tells us that whether they always lived up to it or not, Israel, this was something that they took very seriously. How does this text build on the text right before it? So when we ask this, we're talking about context. Because you don't want to just, it's very dangerous to just pull out one or two verses of something and say, what does this mean? Or, or my least favorite question from so many Bible studies I've been part of. How do you feel about this verse? <laughs> no, there's some good theology coming when that question's asked. <laughs> we we want to we want to look at what happened right before this. We want to look later at what happens right after this. That I, I've been teaching that for years, but it totally when I actually did it in First Corinthians, when I actually did it in Mark with y'all, it changed my understanding of those books to study them piece by piece in order the way they were written. And so we want to look back. What what happened in the in the text right before this? The serpent approached Eve. Okay, the serpent approached Eve. We, we've only we've got two and a half chapters just prior to this. We start out with God created the earth. He looked at it and said it was all what good. 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 Everything was perfect the way God created it. What did He tell them to do? Eat anything you want except for that one tree. That sounds like a pretty sweet deal. They, they live in this paradise. God only gave them one rule. And then along comes the serpent. And what does he do? He twisted the truth. He tried to undermine the authority of God's word. I think if we, if we understand what he's really asking when he says, has God said... If we understand what that question really means, it, it exposes all of his tricks even that he tries on us today. That's not asking, did he actually say that? He's asking about the authority of God's word. It's an attack on the authority of God's word here from the very beginning. All right, and that led to this. So this story, this, this God getting mad didn't happen in isolation. We have chapters leading up to this where God created this perfect paradise God had this close, loving relationship with them. He walked with them in the garden, what that must have looked like and been like. God did all of this for them, and they couldn't manage to do the one thing he asked them to do, told them to do. And when we understand that, we see why God is so mad. Because otherwise, if you don't know the rest of the story and don't engage with the text that comes before, it looks like God is just unreasonable. And nothing could be further from the cake, further from the truth, when we when we understand what happened before. So, how does this text prepare the reader for the text that follows? You, you don't have to go read all you know everything, but what happens? Give me a give me a summary of what happens in the in the next few chapters. So God God punishes them here. What happens next? They turn around and do the same things over again, all the way leading up to the flood. Yeah. Yeah, they kept doing the th same things right up to the flood, after the flood. I was thinking even shorter term, um, they were fruitful and multiplied as God told them to. And what happened there? Their kids were just as rotten and disobedient as they were. <laughs> Cain killed Abel. What's that? Was it Cain and Abel? Cain and Abel. Um, there's some really unfortunate stories in Genesis. But well, there was uh, also uh, some jealousy prior to the yeah, jealousy that led to it. Um, it was a heart condition before it ever got to the point of, of murder. All right, so we see that this, this main idea of this text, that every sin has consequences, really 
shows up through the following chapters. It's setting up the following chapters because their sin had consequences for their sons because their sons were born sinners and they lived it out and they passed it along. And I mean, it just, you can't shove that genie back in the bottle. There were consequences all the way down. All right. Um, how does this text fit within the context of the book in which it's found? If you had to, if you had to summarize Genesis and what Genesis as a whole is about, what would you say? History. Okay, it's history. It's history of what? The creation and the fall. And the creation and the fall, but it, that's, you're not wrong, but that's like three chapters out of the 50. Jewish history. Jewish history. Okay, it's God's interaction with the earliest, with the earliest Jewish people, going all the way back to, to Abraham. How does this fit in that? Why is that? Why is this story so important that it belongs in that history? It's the beginning of sin. It's the beginning of sin, and sin is something they're dealing with from then on. I mean, you've got the next four books deal with uh, deal with the Exodus and all the sin involved there, the idolatry. You've got three books dealing with laws and rituals, trying to deal with the people's sin trying to keep them right with God. You've got chapters after this, I'm sorry, entire books after this showing how Israel sometimes dealt well with right and wrong and how sometimes they fell into sin. So how now that we know all of this and everything we've, we've studied in the first part of this, how would the original audience, how would the people of Israel have interpreted the text? What would they have thought was most important about this? Oh. <laughs> What's that? That's what happened. Huh? Oh, that's what happened. Huh? That's okay. what started. Yes, ma'am. I think probably as it developed that they would realize that there was hope. As, okay. Uh, as you get further into the chapter, mm -hmm. it's all about what God's relationship with Abraham and then with his people and the hope for salvation has come back. Okay. So they, they read it in, in, you know, this is as dark as it gets, but there's hope after after the fact. Okay, good deal. Did, did you have something? To, I thought I saw your hand. Well, I, I, I think I'm not sure, but when, when the kings that came brought the, the nation back to God and they would read the scripture, mm. this is one of the passages that I think they would read. People would go, oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. We had it perfect. Yeah, they they would read it and they would recognize again how far they had how far they had fallen. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I think all of those answers are right. And as we work through this, you'll start hopefully you start to see that sometimes you're answering questions the same way. <coughs> I tend to think that that means not oh I'm so unoriginal in my thoughts. I think it means you're on the right track. If you're seeing similar answers, if you're seeing a pattern your answers it tells you that you're you're on the right track so we talked just about how they would have interpreted this text this is this is pointing out what a big deal sin is this is pointing out where sin started and and its effects and it always grows how would they then question 24 how then would they have responded to the text hopefully they would have returned to god okay hopefully this is one of those things that when you read it you realize Oh, I didn't eat a piece of fruit I wasn't supposed to. I've done bigger things than that, and I'm wrong. Hopefully it's a convicting experience. Yeah. All right. So those two things in question 20, 23 and 24, they would, have under, you know, they would have looked at this and they would have understood the, the, the gravity, the magnitude of sin and its consequences. And hopefully they would have repented. Those, those were kind of our, our answers there. We look back at question 16. What, what idea was the main writer putting forward? And we talked on Sunday night about the main idea was there is always a consequence to sin. Does that answer fit with how we think they would have read it and responded? Okay. To say on one hand, there's always a consequence to sin. And say, on the other hand, they would have looked at this as, a, as, a, as an explanation of the, the, the magnitude of sin 
and, and its consequences. I think those fit pretty well. And we need to stop and, and in, our, in our first section, what does the text say? What, are, what do we think the text says? And then in our second section, how would they have understood the text? Hopefully our answers fit together. And what I've written for you here in your questions in 25 is, if it sounds like they're having two different conversations, if it sounds like our answer back in 16 is a completely different passage of Scripture from how we think they would have answered in 23 and 24, then we might need to go back and, and look at it again because we may have missed something. <coughs> if how we think they would have understood it is completely different from what we got at the beginning, something doesn't match up. Um, question 26 can get a little bit complicated. Um, I still struggle with this one a little bit to answer it. I have to work through it. But how does the text support or explain the main idea from question 16? So usually what we're looking for here is going back to that main idea. Sin always has consequences in this case. And we're saying, how does the text either build up to that idea or how does the text build from that idea? So we might say, because this happened and this happened and this happened, we know sin always has consequences. Or because sin always has consequences, this happened and this happened and this happened. I think it's probably, in this case, it's the latter one. Because sin always has consequences, what are some of the things that, that he gives to explain that main idea? What are some of the consequences he handed down? Pain and childbirth. Pain and childbirth. Although that was not cursed, like you said. Right. Snake has no feet. Right. Adam will have to work. Adam, Adam will, will struggle in his work, yeah. He talks about the, the struggle between the husband and wife. Um, what else? Food. Food. We sure did. I didn't get anything planted this, this week, uh, this year. Yes, sir. It's not a bird, but death going to die. Yeah, death. <laughs> yes. And I think that's the most excited anybody's ever been about saying the word death. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, forgot all about that one. That may be the most, the most important one. Um, and I think one thing that I would probably write down on the list earlier when we're talking about things that I want to get nailed down, I want clarification on, I want to research further, what exactly does he mean by death there? Because we know they died physically as a result. You know, the, the easy Sunday school answer is spiritual death, and I think that's right, but I want to dig deeper in exactly what is he talking about when he says spiritual death. I know it's separation, but in their case, what does that look like? In, in, Mark, in our case, what does that look like? That would be something I would want to research further. So you take that main idea, and, and you see that it, it, everything in the text is connected to it. Sin always has a consequence, and we see that in all these ways that he lists out. And that begins to be evidence for you of the consequences of sin. And, and from a preaching standpoint, you go through and, and use those examples. Most of you are not preaching, but from a Bible study standpoint, those then become things for us to, to realize how sin affects everything around us. It wasn't just one consequence because of their sin. There were all these consequences that they could never have imagined. That becomes helpful to us to have that truth locked away in us because when we're about to sin, hopefully God brings to remembrance what we've studied in his word that, wait, there are all these consequences and a lot of them are unintended. Okay? Are there any related texts of Scripture that come to mind where you could find additional insights? Can you think of other Scriptures that, that deal with this topic or similar language? Let, let's let's do this. Where would you even find those things? If you don't have the Bible memorized to know, oh yes, it's in Ezekiel thirty six. You know, where where would you find other passages that that speak to these ideas? Concordances, okay. You could find some of these words in in the concordance. Some of you may have chain references in your Bible. You've got the little the tiny. You need a magnifying glass to see the tiny little letters or numbers. And they, they show you, oh, I can go to such and such verse. I will tell you, one of the, one of the best 
Um, one of the best resources I've found, and one that I use frequently, is called a Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. I can't, I, I think R.A. Torrey is the one who put it together, but I can't remember for sure. Um, you can get print copies. You can get them on a lot of Bible software. I think if you go to Bible Gateway and maybe studylight.org, you can read them completely free. And what you do is you go to a, a path, you, you go to whatever verse it is, and it might have it divided by phrases where he says, say verse 16, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. There may be three or four verses that deal with that topic that you can then turn to and, and research. Sometimes it's by topic, sometimes it's because they use a similar phrase, but that treasury of scripture knowledge has been a tremendous help to me in researching where God talks about similar things in multiple places, because sometimes you can pull in things from elsewhere that, that shed light on, on the topic. And then Question 28 is pause to research the issues you wrote down in question 17. You don't want to just write them down, but you actually want to take some time to, to study them out. Sometimes for me, this is the hardest part of Bible study or especially sermon preparation because I will have questions that may or may not end up having anything to do with the final sermon. And I don't know until I've run them down and studied them out. And I, I, you know, I may spend an hour researching something and say that really doesn't add anything to what we're talking about. It's important, it's good to know, may use it later, but it doesn't add anything here. Or it may it may shed so much light on what we're on, on what we're studying that it takes the sermon in a whole different direction. But you're not really you're not really done until you've answered those lingering questions that, that have popped into your head. So we're not going to do that tonight, stop and answer all the questions. We'd be here all night, but we, uh, once we've done that, we have a pretty good idea of how they understood, how they understood the scriptures and, and what we can learn from that. So we move on to the cross. What does the text tell us about Jesus? If Jesus is directly featured or mentioned about the uh, in the text, what does it teach about him? This would be things like in the Gospels. It's really not hard to see Jesus because they're all about him. In, in a lot of Paul's letters and a lot of the other letters of the New Testament, he's, he's right there. And so it's a little easier to get to the cross from some of those passages than elsewhere. And so you just look for what is, what is Jesus doing? What does this tell us about Jesus? Um, he's not directly mentioned or featured in this text, so we can skip question 29. If you weren't here Sunday night, I did tell everybody, the answer to some of these questions will be there's not one. And, that, and that's okay. You know, if you're looking, are there any lists? No, that, that's fine. You don't have to make them appear. Okay, question number 30. If he's not directly featured or mentioned, where did this text and its main idea fit in the overall arc of God's redemptive plans? When I say the overall arc of God's redemptive plans, I mean this plan God has had all along. He was going to create us. We were going to mess up. He was going to send a Savior. We were going to be restored to him. Where does this fit in that? And you had your hand up. This may be related to both questions 29 and 30, but okay. back in, in uh, verse 15, uh, the scripture says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, with a capital S, yes. which is meant to be Jesus. Yes. We're going to deal with that in question 31. Oh, <laughs> You're all right, though. You saw it. That's good. You're already looking for Jesus. The next here. word, he, is also capitalized. Yes. So the, the this is because some place this this would be an example of what I'm talking about with a, a picture, a prophecy, or a promise. <coughs> that honestly, that's that's what made me think of doing Genesis three here. But not every even Old Testament passage is going to have that. So we look at this unfolding story. We're not quite, I mean, we're, we're a little past the creation point. We're talking about the fall, right? This is something that we can understand our sin and our need for Jesus from looking at this passage. That's one way we can connect this to the cross. A passage like this, and understanding that sin has consequences, it helps us understand why Jesus 
had to come because we had messed up so completely. Um, so that's one angle. And again, the importance of this, this, this is the, this, is, this step of, of connecting it to the cross is the step I had never been taught when I went through training to do this. And, and the reason why it's so important is because otherwise you, you can very easily just end up with a message of try harder, do better. I've preached a lot of those sermons starting out. You know, let's look at the Old Testament. Here's why you need to do all the things that Moses did. It might be true, but it's not quite the bridge to the gospel. Question 31. Does the text feature any pictures, prophecies, or promises from God fulfilled in or by Jesus Christ? Brother Jack, you're up. <laughs> um, Eve's seed is going to be Jesus. Yes, the seed of the woman. Let's talk about that a minute. In what sense is Jesus, would, would, would we call Jesus the seed of the woman? Why would he be called that? <laughs> He doesn't have a biological father. Doesn't have a biological father. If you believe the virgin birth, and I do, and by the way, so does the scripture. Actually, that's why I believe it, because that's what scripture teaches. If you believe the virgin birth, then Jesus is literally the seed of the woman. I mean, there's there's no human man involved there. And so he, he is... I think probably the, the early Jews understood that, the Israel understood that to be just humanity. But when it came to what was prophesied in Isaiah 7.14, and then when we see the fulfillment in Jesus Christ, we, we're able to look back on that and say, oh, that's what he was talking about there. Jesus is the seed of the woman, and it says, what's going what's gonna to happen to him? What's going to happen to the seed of the woman? His heel is going to be bruised. And in return, what is he going to do? Crush the head of the serpent. <coughs> I think we talked about this a little bit Sunday when we, when we read this. But the, the bruising to the heel, it's uncomfortable, right? Um, snake bites you in the heel. The snake probably thinks he's won. Right? But, uh, it, and in certain circumstances, it may be a pretty pretty dangerous situation. But how is the... Jesus' case, the, the bruising of his heel was extreme. Yes. Both of, both of them, when they drove that nail to it. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there was a literal bruising of the heel, yes. What's the difference between that bruising of the heel and the crushing of the head? It's final. The, the no. crushing of the head is final. What, what were you saying? I was going to say that. Say one that, leads yeah. to death and the other one may not. Yeah. One of them is definitely fatal. The other one could be fatal. So we see a picture in here of the seed of the woman. And we see Jesus at the cross. His enemies thought he had won. Or thought they had won. When they put Jesus to death. I'm sure... Satan seems to know some scripture, but he doesn't seem to understand it. And we see that from his conversations with Jesus in the wilderness. He seems to, you know, he's like people on the History Channel. He seems to know some scripture, but doesn't seem to understand it or how to use it. What do we say we need to understand it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, exactly. He didn't have it. Right. So I think it's entirely possible, you know, they get Jesus up on the cross, and Satan thinks he's won. Jesus is dead, comes off that cross, gets buried in the ground. He thinks he's won and it's over. He's bruised his heel. Three days later, Jesus comes back and crushes that serpent's head. Not just defeating Satan's plans, but he actually defeated sin and death and the grave. He, he defeated all of it, and the death blow was final. And so right here in, in Genesis 3, we have one of the earliest mentions of the gospel. So we see that sin always has consequences, but we see that God has dealt with those consequences for us. Okay? Um, any aspect or point to characteristics of Christ? We don't because we've, we've already answered how this passage deals with Jesus. But there's, there's going to be, you know, you can kind of point to plan. 
there may be times when you're studying about King David, or, well, King David would be a little easier to get to Jesus. You may be studying about Samson. How do you connect that to Jesus? Well, it's what Samson started should have been. How Jesus, you know, Samson was set apart to God and fell from that. Jesus on the little obedience to the Father. You know, like a shoehorn and force the box of saying something they don't say. But Jesus is all over this book. There's stuff all over this book that point that draws our attention to Jesus, and and that's that needs to be. Our studies don't just need to need to to leave us knowing more things or trying harder. They they ultimately need to point us to Jesus. And then a question that I've come to look at: How did God relate to His people when this text was written, and how did Jesus affect that relationship or bring it to that point? You can look at and say. What was the people's relationship with God in this, in this story? And, and you could look, for example, I mean, my goodness, you could, you could be studying Leviticus. What was God's relationship to the people in Leviticus? Yes, sir. It's almost transactional. Okay. Where you do the sacrifice and you can, you know, God's presence is with you in a sense. And yeah. Yeah, that's a good word for it. It was almost transactional. There were all these rules, and you came to God through these rituals and all these things you had to do, and, and still it was almost like God was at arm's length. He was, he was just out of reach. And so, if nothing else, to find how this points to Jesus, you look at what that relationship was and how did Jesus... If you're studying Leviticus and you're seeing that trend, that like you said, it's almost transactional. On the surface, it looks transactional. You see that, that God says you have to do this, and even, even then we're, we're still a little ways apart. What did Jesus do to change that? <clears throat> to get to the Father. Okay. What were you going to say? Well, again, it's a little transformational mm -hmm. where it's, it's based on faith yeah. rather than those transactions where you have to set belief yes. in Christ. Yeah. Absolutely. He fulfilled all those requirements so that now, now we can come to him by faith. Yeah, there's, a, there's a relationship now that there wasn't there before. And so even if you're looking, at a, you're looking at a passage going, where in the world is Jesus in this? You can look at how Jesus changed the relationship that they had to God in that passage. All right. This should be the easy part. Should be. Today, in light of everything we've studied, do any of the promises in the text apply to us today? Be, be careful with this. Somebody asked me when I said not every, I think it might have even been here. Somebody asked me when I said not every promise in Scripture is to us today. They said, how do we tell? The only thing I can give you is context. You know? I said, if God made a promise to Abraham, that's not necessarily a promise to you and me. If God... Um, you know, God told, I think God told Noah he would shut him in the ark. That's not a promise that he's going to shut us inside a boat. So we, we look at the promises and we say, are any of these, if so, um, how do they apply to us? If not, what can we learn from them anyway? You had your hand up. I was going to say, I, I haven't experienced it personally, but it's still rather painful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and as far as the toil of the earth, now, I'm not a gardener. There's parts that are going to work that are really good. Even if you're not working the, the soil, there is still struggle and work. I, I love my job. I, I, I know it's not exactly a job. It's a calling. It's a ministry. I love what I get to do, but there are some days that are not fun. And there are some days in your job that are not fun. And I can attest gardening is difficult. As he said, we, we men don't know firsthand, but we think childbirth is still painful. I think I heard that somewhere. <laughs> Anybody? All awake. <laughs> All right. So some of these promises still apply to us. They're small. Uh, even if the promises are not to us, we can still learn something from them. We can look at promises that were made specifically to Abraham and look at how God fulfilled those promises, and we can learn something about the faithfulness of God that applies to our lives today.
Uh, do any of the commands or calls in the text, that's back when we were looking at the verbs there at the beginning, um, do they apply to us today? And if so, how? If not, what can we learn from them anyway? Um, and I could not, I told you earlier, I couldn't any image. Back a little tree where he's tree. But to us today, we don't even know where the tree is. Look at where we can't find it. So that command is not to us, but it's there for us to learn from. What can we learn from the command to them? Don't do that. Then we should obey what he tells us. We should obey what he tells us. Yeah. Our, our natural inclination is to go to that tree. Yeah. Whatever the Yeah. Until after we kids, adults, everybody. Yeah. Whatever our, the tree is. Whatever the tree the is. It's the sin nature. It is. It's the sin nature. Our nat what he said was our natural inclination is to go to that tree. I read I read something on Facebook where one of the electrical companies said they were encouraging people to turn their thermostats up to 80. I was like, I'm going to turn mine down even lower now. That just <laughs> That's the sin nature. Whatever tree we're told not to touch, we want to touch. And so we can, we can even if the stuff is not to us, we can treat it as though it's for us and we can learn from it. Um, are there any other principles in the text that apply today, and how? Show us the need for a Savior. We, we still need a Savior, absolutely. There's still consequences to our sin, and for that reason, we still God need a Savior. A yeah, what's that? He has a plan. God has a plan. They had no sooner messed up. That's a good point. They had no sooner messed up than God announced what the plan was. That. Uh, that's because God knew they were going to mess up and already had the plan in place. <laughs> Question 37, how can we learn from the examples, good or bad, in the text? Are there any good examples in this passage we've looked at other than God? Because I don't think so. So how can we learn from the bad examples? Don't do what they did. Don't do what they did. Just be obedient. It works out better in the long run. And again, I know we're... Some of these answers overlap, but that's a good thing. That means we're we're coming to a pattern here. Yes, sir. Well, I think there's a there's a lesson about confession, mm -hmm. right? Because God gave him that opportunity. He already knew they messed up, but he asked, "Hey, where you at?" That's and they were like, "Oh, well, we were just hiding because you know they didn't say it was because they ate from the tree." That's true. <laughs> yeah, somebody pointed out at Falls Creek last week. God never asks a question he doesn't already know the answer to. Much like my wife. Okay. It's just an opportunity to say, are, are you going to are you gonna tell me what I already know? Um, yeah, God, there, there's an opportunity to confess. And it wouldn't necessarily make all the consequences of sin go away if they had confessed what they had done, but the, the fellowship might have been restored more quickly. So, but yeah, all of these things are things that we can learn and put into practice that we pull out of this passage. What does this passage show me that I need to change? And you may not want to answer that one out loud. <laughs> Something we should be asking ourselves as we look to apply the scriptures. What is it in this passage that there is in my life that I need to change? Sometimes it's an action. Sometimes it's an attitude. I like this question. Question 39. What does this passage show me as a reason to praise God? That he, that he didn't just wipe them away. He, he gave him a chance. He didn't just wipe them away. He was forgiving. Okay. What else? He has a plan for redemption. He has a plan for redemption. Okay. I, I like flesh, but in the spirit, I like that God is big enough and holy enough that he doesn't feel the need to compromise with our sin. I don't have, we don't have to wonder where God stands on things. That's something we can praise God for. All right, and then question number 40. I'm not going to ask you to answer this one out loud, but it is something we should ask as we're studying the scriptures. What specific steps can I take to walk in obedience to my Lord after what I've just studied? And once you've gotten to that point, you, you've gotten, in my experience, you've gotten a lot more out of study than, than I got all those years just reading it. And that doesn't mean that these are the only questions you can ever ask. 
but over the last several years as I've been using formats like this, uh, it, it's helped me get a lot further in my study, not just for myself, but in what I give you. And as a matter of fact, some of you will probably notice um, I'm not real good at like three points with alliteration, usually like Adrian Rogers. But a lot of times in my preaching, you'll see three or four main, main ideas on the screen, and that's usually me working through these, these questions. What does the text say? What did the people understand? How does it point us to Jesus, and what do we do with it now? And if we've answered those four questions, whichever of these 40 or whatever else we need to answer those four questions, we've, we've taken a step forward in our, in our Bible study and really understanding it and, and, and living it.